talk about the value of color. Too often we separate value and color and end up trying to match the color we see, uh, which usually means we're going to have the wrong value and uh, ultimately that's the wrong color. Because when we have a painting that doesn't seem to work, we tend to blame the color. We can't mix the colors we want, but it's the value that's, that's wrong. Because ultimately we can have any color or color scheme in a painting uh, and it'll work as long as the values are work. So uh, I want to go through the thought process and the steps of uh, mixing a color and a value kind of in the same, same thought pattern. We're going to be talking about the value of color. And I put those two things together uh, because we generally think of color and value as two separate things. And they're really not. It's the value almost, almost all the time. I mean, you can have color that's too strong or too gray. But generally, when the painting doesn't work, it's always the value. So we want to think in terms of value and color together. And if we break it down to two stages when we're mixing color. The first is identifying the color we see. And that's making a color decision. And we look at this painting here. This is by uh, Marion Watchtall. She was a California Impressionist, uh, early to mid uh, 20th century. And she painted outside uh, most of the time. And as a result, she was able to simplify because when you're not used to photographs or tied to photographs and you're outside you have to make quick decisions and simplify things. Now she did a lot of studio painting but mostly they were done from outdoor, smaller outdoor paintings. So she's able to simplify a lot like the shape of the distant trees back in here and over in here, the shape of the field. Everything is a basic shape and value. She saw shape, value, and color of the sky, the clouds in the sky, the mountains, very simple shapes and colors. You can almost break it down just to abstract shapes. And that comes from just the repetition of painting outside or at least when you're photographing, you're really paying attention when you're out there uh, to composition and to looking at things and, and seeing how you're going to pull them together into shapes. And then in painting in the studio, you're trying to see things in larger abstract shapes, then deciding of the value and color of those shapes. But anyway, getting back to the, the stage of the value and color, I like for these distant trees back in here, they're not the greens, they're far enough away that they turn more blue to blue violet. So I want to identify that as a blue violet. I could easily identify it as a bluish green, you know, a blue gray. Depends on how I want the color in the painting to go. I'm not tied to the photograph or even outside of what I see. I want to mix a color that best uh, suggests the light that I see or the mood that I want to capture. So identifying the color, in this case a blue violet, and always pick a color from the color wheel. Otherwise you're causing just a lot of extra trouble for yourself. You're trying to match a color you see in the photograph. So you end up just mixing and mixing until you match it. But identify it as a color from the color wheel. So if I look at this and I say blue violet, then my goal is to match the value using blue violet. I've already decided the color. So there's no mystery now in what color I want to come up with. The struggle now is to come up with the right value or the goal. And then after that, you know how thick or thin I want it to be, but it's always the color first in my mind of what I want to mix. And then when I'm mixing, what's more important is the value. Same thing with all these colors. The, I look at these trees and it to me it's a, an orange green. Over here is more of a yellow green. And these are a deeper red or orange green. There's a reddish green up there. So make it definite. Of course, red green isn't on the color wheel, but to me, it's a yellow green with a little bit of red in it or orange in it. And then when I'm mixing it, my focus is always the value. Because I might get off on the color I want, but if it's the right value, it doesn't really matter. You know, if this is a, a yellow green, a warm bluish green, or just a green green, it would still work if the value is right. That's what I'm talking about when I'm mentioning the, the value of a color. A lot more important than the color you choose. Of course, it helps to be able to simplify everything first. Then it's easier to pick shapes of 
value and color. So another one here of Marion Watch Tool. Again, it's designed very nicely. So designing and composition comes first because if you have a good composition, it's always going to draw the viewer into it. She simplifies big enough that she can pick large areas now, like the blue, blue greens in here, yellow greens, the darker blue greens and dark yellow greens of these trees. She can pick, she picked a definite color and worked on the value. The other thing is simplifying it, uh, not overdoing the details, but she's not tied to a photograph. Even if she is using a photograph here, she's not tied to it. She's developed her own color sense. So it's easier, of course, when, when you pick a color for an area you want to mix when you know your palette. And the only way to know your palette is to do tons and tons of painting. So that's why early on it's not important how your paintings look. You're just getting in that practice of seeing what the colors on your palette can do. Then after a while, it's, you can you see a blue violet in the hills back in here and you know right away how you can mix that bluish violet. You know, using the blue and alizarin for a strong violet or blue and cad red for a little grayer violet or what to add to them to make them grayer or brighter. Same thing with the yellow green. I know right away to me that's cad yellow with blue and then there's some alizarin or orange added to it. If you're really unsure about color, your main goal is to just keep knocking out paintings until you developed a color sense with the colors on your, your palette. Uh, you can do color charts, which are a big help, but I think it's more important just to do more paintings. And whether you have a lot of time or a little time, block out some time, whether it's once a week, uh, twice a month, or three or four times a week, where you're doing smaller paintings and the goal is just to learn your palette. Picking out uh, uh, several landscapes, lining them up, and just knocking them out one after the other. It's all about repetition, not about cranking out a really nice painting. Hopefully the really nice paintings come after a while, but so it's all practice and learning what you can mix with the colors in front of you. I have one more. This is a painting by Chauncey Ryder. Again, an early 20th century uh, East Coast uh, tonalist. He wasn't really an Impressionist, although he became that later. And it really helps me to see how these artists viewed color and value. He's real careful to get separate values on these planes. Sky is the lightest, then this slanted hill then the slanted mountain, then the upright trees. So it really separates the values right away and then picks a definite color. This is not photographic color at all. The sky is more yellow than I think what you can get with photographs. The mountains are more blue. So the greens are a lot stronger than you would get on this type of day with, with a camera. So it's not photographic color at all. It's not just copying a photograph. And he also painted outside mostly and then did larger studio paintings from his outdoor sketches. He's using definite colors and then concentrating on keeping them the right value. So make the color decision first, then it's a matter of mixing the right value with that color you've already decided. And that sounds like an oversimplification, and but it should be a simple idea. It's not easy, but it should be simple. If you make it more complicated than it is, then it becomes a real struggle. Now this is the uh, image we're going to use. First thing I always want to do is decide if I'm going to crop it or not. This is my focal point, I've decided, and I can get rid of some unwanted space in the sky and in the foreground. I'll leave a little bit of the tree over here, the branches are pointing to the focal point. And now I've zoomed in and got rid of some excess space uh, that makes everything else smaller. So I'll probably use this composition, but I want to emphasize the uh, values and than the values of the planes. So when I look at this, I see a dark starting with the tree, and I'm just thinking overall value. Shadow in there, then I got the upright shadows, and the upright darks, and they're, they're not all shadows. They're, some of them are light, but they're darker than anything in the flat ground. And this would be darker than the flat ground shadow. So this would be my, primarily my shadow pattern. If I can get that in there, everything this is a little lighter, then I can decide the sky's the lightest, then the rooftop, then the road, then the fence, and the grass, and so on. Um, but find that overall dark pattern first. 
And again, as the artist, you can push things a little darker or lighter as long as they remain consistent with the plane. So I don't want to get the same value down here as I have up here. Now the value drawing, it doesn't matter. I'm just finding the overall shadow pattern. But when you're in your painting, you want to separate the values of the planes a little bit more. Then I want to think color-wise. I want to think about the value of this green after determining it's a blue-green, reddish-orange here, maybe a red-violet here. You know, definite colors. This is a, uh, a grayish, uh, probably a gray-red-violet for these trees here. I know to gray or red violet with yellow orange maybe, but I'm making a decision of what the color is based on the color wheel and the colors I can mix on my palette. And then when I'm mixing, I'm thinking value because I've already decided on what the color is going to be.